Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. I'm talking to Jenny Harris, who is the creative producer for the Landlines and Watermarks project. Uh, This is a 509 art production, which aims to work with communities in Calderdale to share stories about the Calder Valley in West Yorkshire. And Calderland is a newly composed people's opera, examining how these communities have been shaped by their relationship to water in a number of ways. Written by Mike Kenny and composed by Richard Taylor, the new piece has a cast of local singers and musicians and is due to be performed at the recently restored Grade 1 listed Peace Hall in Halifax from the 29th of September to the 1st of October. Um, Jenny, I know you're really busy with the sort of uh, work on the show, so thank you for talking to us. Uh, Could you just start by telling us how this project came about, please? Sure. As you know, a lot of Yorkshire was flooded in the Boxing Day floods of 2015. A lot of Calderdale was very badly flooded at the time. It was a really quite devastating flood. My theatre company, uh, 509 Arts, actually is based in Shipley, which is just in the neighbouring valley. Um, uh, Our town was also flooded. And we are a theatre company that um, looks at climate change issues. Actually, we've done a lot of work around climate change and the arts. And we started to think we should do something about the floods. And we approached a few local authorities. And it just so happened that Calderdale had had a lot of money from the government looking at the restoration of the valleys, particularly looking at flood defences and things. But the, the local authority wanted to do a cultural project that celebrated community spirit, really, because there was a lot of that in evidence directly after the floods. So um, our timing was really serendipitous. Um, They did do a call-out, but we sort of had a project in mind, and we very quickly amassed a really strong group of partners from across the Calder Valley. Obviously, everybody in this valley has been touched or affected in some way by the floods, and it was quite easy to pull something together that would celebrate the valley and its people mm-hmm. thank you yeah so um i mean i was in york at the time of the floods here and i know that so much of yorkshire was really really devastated it really was and the fact that it happened on boxing day as well is is quite significant um, and i mean during the course of this you know because obviously people had christmas decorations out they had presents and, I mean, some people literally lost everything, independent businesses. I mean, there were a lot of those in the Calder Valley in places like Hebden Bridge. And we started to pick up, uh, when we started this project, actually, it was just before Boxing Day 2016. And there was a lot of real, really tangible nervousness about getting to that date and, you know, some people just didn't want to talk to us or engage with us until after they'd got past that Boxing Day 2016 day and got through the year. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's it's really difficult to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's experienced flooding in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what we're trying to do a bit in this project. Uh, so how, are you, how is that this project working on that? You've hinted there that you went out and really spoke to a lot of people from the communities affected. Yeah, so right from the start, we wanted this to be a real community project. So um, this has worked at many levels, really. So we have um, gone out and spoken to and gathered stories from people, not just about the floods, actually, but about water and the way it shaped the valley and the way it's encouraged industry into the valley and people. We did a lot of research with things like the local archives service and the museum service, in particular the sort of chief curator of Calderdale Museums, Angela Clare. And we quite soon discovered that actually Calderdale has got a history of flooding. But also it has really, you know, the hills, the valleys, the mills that came here, all of those things have been because of the water in the valley. There is um, there's quite a famous bike company called Orange Bikes, Mm-hmm. who um, have a manufacturing base in Calderdale and they say it's because they can really test the muddy conditions <laughs> if, they, uh, if, they can, if their bikes can operate well in Calderdale they can cope anywhere basically. <laughs> so there's some really interesting, we have boat builders in the Calder Valley so there, there are some really fascinating ways that people have, uh, have built that relationship with water and it's not all negative I think that's what we really wanted to look at was look at the floods but in a much bigger 
broader, holistic light so that it wasn't just a negative story because obviously making a story about the flood, well, it's quite totemic anyway, isn't it, a flood opera. So we've really uncovered a lot of really interesting stories about how people interact with water in this Mm. valley. And we've tried to pull all that into an opera because we didn't want it to be just about the floods. (laughs) What we really wanted to do was set those floods in the context of a wider story about water. Mm. What led to the choice of an opera form in the first place? You know, what's what's um, what was the what was driving that? What what does that form bring to this subject matter? Well, I think actually it's an interesting question. Is that because opera is a very loaded word, and we did for a long time think about calling it something else because we knew that if we said we're doing an opera, it might be an issue for some people. And we landed on a people's opera in the end because we couldn't really think of another form that best expressed what it is. Uh, I mean, it is a folk opera in that it brings together lots of different musical styles. It's quite oratorio-like, actually, in the way it's constructed. So it's it's very driven by the music. Um, It's quite dramatic in places. Um, there are lots of, you know, there's a rap section, there's um, a jazz section, there's a Kaylee trio that come on at uh, a certain point. So it's a real blending of the musics of the valley as well. But really that dramatic t- storytelling through music, I think, is what we wanted to achieve. And really the choir, um, the chorus drive that storytelling. So Mike Kenny, who's actually York-based, and quite a, I mean, he's probably the UK's most successful writer for children, certainly for children's work, but he's written a lot of musical material as well and songs. So he really jumped to the chance of writing a libretto. And then we've got a um, composer, Richard Taylor, who's a theatre composer, actually. So can take that material and make it really accessible. So it, 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 it's not a high art opera. You know, it's sung by amateurs. But it's got that sense of drama and scale that an opera might have over a musical. We really didn't want to call it a musical because I think that would be quite demeaning to it. But it's it's definitely... A, a, the music is accessible in the way that um, um, a musical might be accessible. But, yeah, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? It is really tricky to get land on the right terminology for this kind of thing. We actually think there's a gap there. So... <laughs> well, yes, it does sound like it's um, it's kind of playing uh, with and between a lot of genres. And as you say, you know, if you as soon as you say opera, there are some people who you know will or won't go with certain expectations. As soon as you say musical, you know, there's a whole different set of expectations for it. Exactly, it's the baggage that comes with those terms sometimes. Mm. The other thing I should say is that because the Peace Hall is an incredibly dramatic setting. Actually, if you've not been before, it's a Georgian grade one listed building with a huge courtyard. It's a huge building with colonnades and balconies. Um, It's absolutely beautiful. There's nowhere else like it in the country. But creating a set for that space presents its own problems because actually you're competing with the built architecture. So what we, we landed on in the end was doing some digital artwork for the piece. So we're working with two digital artists who are collaborating to create animations and visuals and film that will accompany the piece. And then we have some non-movement, uh, non-singing performers as well and some dramatic moments. Mm-hmm. So there is a whole sort of suite of things happening throughout the performance. Uh, you alluded to it earlier in that there were amateur singers in the chorus. Um, and that seems to be another way that this uh, project is involving the local communities. How are they, you know, what, are they sort of, is it an entirely community cast or is it, um, how, how does that work? It's entirely community cast and how we did that was to set up a series of open workshops, singing workshops across the valley in various locations that were drop-in that any singer, singers of any ability could come to, whether you could or couldn't read music. And from that, anybody who enjoyed the sessions and wanted to carry on was welcome then to be in the choir. So it really is an all-comers chorus, um, and we've always wanted to have that open aspect to it. Uh, so there are definitely singers in there who've never sung in a choir before. 
We've also, uh, so there are just over 100 adult singers uh, in the chorus and we have been having regular rehearsals. One of the challenges of this project is the time scale. Actually, we're doing a probably a two year project in six <laughs> months. So the choir have been working really, you know, and it's it's specially composed music. Mm. So it's quite challenging in places for, for amateur singers, but they've responded brilliantly. It's sounding amazing. So that's working really well. And then alongside that, we've recruited 100 children via Calderdale Schools who form a children's chorus. So there are over 200 singers mm. as part of the piece, and then about 12 musicians, a Cayley band, and then the performers are all local amateur performers as well. Mm. So, yeah, truly, truly a community production in that mm. sense, but mm. with top quality artists creating the material that they're singing. I think that's mm. the key thing. It's not a community production without very high artistic values. Uh, so you're managing essentially a, a massive team, but uh, not only, you know, not directly managing those performers necessarily, but, you know, you, you're sort of overseeing the, the project as a creative producer. Can you tell us a bit more about that role? Sure. Well, actually, Calderland is just one of the par- things that we're doing as part of the mm-hmm. Landlines and Watermarks project. So it's got three elements. We've got this huge community opera, which is a produ- you know massive production in itself. Then we've actually got a people's fair happening um, over the same weekend in the courtyard, which is a festival and street party of local talent and creativity, I suppose. And then we've also commissioned six new works across the valley one in each of the local towns that were flooded. Um, so right from Todmorden through to Brickhouse. Um, and each of those have had big community involvement. So it's a very big, sprawling project. So there's been a lot to do. But in a way, I think that's... If, you, if you're if you a creative producer, that's what you respond well to, to be honest. I, I like the challenge of having a lot of different things to do at any one time. So I'm very busy at the moment dealing with production issues, so technical specifications, where we're going to stage the opera, the the detail of mics and PA systems and lighting rigs and crowd control and, you know, real logistics at this stage of the production itself. But my job can include anything from fundraising to going and talking to stakeholders to organising rehearsals to booking acts. And it's a real huge range. Essentially, it suits anyone who's quite organised and likes people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think um, organisational skills, obviously, but actually I think you you need to fundamentally enjoy working with people to do this Mm -hmm. job. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your route to this uh, job? You know, how have you found yourself uh, managing this project? Well, I hate to say it because it's not particularly helpful, but it was almost accidental, really. I um, I did a music degree at Goldsmiths, and then I uh, was a jobbing musician for a few years. And then I started working on the other side, so I started promoting, and I ended up getting a job um, actually for Leeds City Council booking their music program which was uh, I think a slightly circuitous route but they wanted somebody with a different background and I suppose the thing is that I cover a lot of bases because I obviously I'm classically trained but then I played in a band for a lot of years I really you know I work with a lot of jazz musicians so I think that spread of music helps and then yeah, I think having that experience of being a performer and um, then working as a promoter is really important, actually, because you, you develop a really good understanding of what it's like to be on the road or what it's like to be a jobbing artist and what the kind of things that make the difference when you arrive at a venue or a festival. And I've sort of taken that with me, really, which feels very sort of important to the way I work. Yeah, and I've been freelance for about seven years now, so I work on lots and lots of different events and festivals, mainly as a programmer, actually. And is, is 509 Arts, you know, in part your company? It's a, are you, are you... It is, yeah, there's three of us who are directors of the company, and it's our very much our company, and we focus on theatre productions with a climate change agenda, I suppose. Um, because it's our company, we can take on projects that we want, 
to work on. And quite often what we do is we, we do some consultancy, which then supports and underpins the creative work that we do. I think a lot of small companies uh, in the creative arts work like that. Yeah, and then we just bring in a freelance team to help on big productions like this. Mm-hmm. How long has 509 Arts been going? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I think about 15 years, actually, mm-hmm. but it's really just taken off in the last few years. I think I came on board in 2012. Al Dix, who's the artistic director of the project, he started the company and we met because I was programming the Cultural Olympiad for the mm-hmm. 2012 Olympics and we just really got on. So we decided to carry on working together. So just um, maybe for a final question, going back to Calderland, the um, current project preoccupying, you know, taking up your time. Again, it's something you alluded to earlier, but I'm just wondering about working with this community, the question of working with this community to take some message further afield. In what ways is it? Because climate change is obviously a massive issue and a pressing question of our time. Um, is there is there some element of the project which is kind of taking that out, you know, taking, p- putting a message out further beyond the Yorkshire region? Well, I hope so. I think um, what we try to do with the climate change, I mean, obviously you don't want to sort of beat people over the head with it, do you? So I think it is a su- it, there's a subtlety there around the way you frame your artistic process and content if you are an issues-based organization and I I would never say that we were Mm -hmm. Uh, we are working with the BBC a bit on this project actually and they um, one of their weather presenters is doing a hundred year forecast for Calderdale which will be screened in the interval so it's things like that that we're doing that hopefully will just underpin the project and get people to think a bit more carefully about those kind of wider issues and and in relation to flooding i mean i think people are waking up to the bigger issues around flooding and climate change particularly in this area and the interesting thing about calderdale is a lot of the people in calderdale don't necessarily recognize that they're from calderdale they would just say they're from hebden bridge or they're from halifax or and actually i think another thing about this project is is sort of bringing people together from different parts of the valley into one creative project and looking at what it means to be part of a valley-wide community and and again t- sending out that message to a bigger audience. That's great. Well, um, Calderland runs from the 29th of September to the 1st of October in the Peace Hall in Halifax and entry is ticketed but free. And Jenny Harris, thanks so much for talking to us. You're welcome. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.